Okay, thank you, Rick. Um, and thank you for everyone for coming to my talk. Um, I will Today I will be giving you a talk on structural equation modeling, uh, which is a really uh, technique that we use a lot and especially in my in, in me and Roger's lab. Um, in particular, I'll be talking about how we could do sort of how we could combine the brain and cognition through structural equation modeling. So theory-based relations between the brain and behavior through structural equation modeling. And the since I my field that I work in is intelligence research. So I so basically throughout the talk, I will be giving examples of how you can use structural equation modeling, particularly um, in intelligence research. So as an example um, scenario, you have the positive manifold of cognitive abilities, which is one of the um, most rep replicable um, results in all of psychology, particularly in, in especially in intelligence research. So for example, we know that if you do well on one cognitive task, right, such as vocabulary, you also tend to do very well on other cognitive tasks, such as math, right? So all of these are positively correlated with each other, um, which Spearman found in, in, in the early uh, 20th century, and he called this the positive manifold of cognitive abilities, right? However, now that you have this observation, this, these, these ubiquitous positive correlations, you still don't know exactly why everything is correlated, right? So you might want to try to find some type of mechanistic cause or causes for the reason you for the emergence of this for the you know the observance of this of this positive manifold. So you might ask yourself, okay, well, what are the causes of intelligence, right? So we know, for example, there's multiple genes that are involved. Um, we also know, of course, your brain is important, which I'll be talking about. Um, today and how you can model these relations. Um, and we also know, so for example, your environment is important. Uh, maybe not, you know, this environment, uh, although, you know, you obviously won't be intelligent if, you know, we all die from climate change. Um, but particularly this type, this type of environment, right? So you have, you know, if you have a supportive and stimulating uh, family environment, right, that's going to, that, you know, that's very nurturing, that can help you you as well. So there are also environmental effects to um, intelligence that, that, that influence it. So in the structural equation uh, modeling framework, or as I'll say, through, continue saying through, abbreviate through his talk as just SEM, um, is a statistical framework that combines sort of factor analysis and multiple multivariate approaches. So for example, you could do exploratory and confirmatory um, analysis. Um, you even could do this also, um, which I know uh, Alex might be because he at least you know he loves uh, Bayesian principles. So you have like Bayesian SEM. Um, you can also do uh, you know t-test, basic t-test and, and, and SEM as well. And basically, sort of the premise, one of the premise behind behind um, SEM is that basically you're modeling the hypothesized relationship of a latent variable, which is unobserved, right? So you cannot measure it directly with other it's, its relation to other what are called manifest or observed variables so for example your latent variable could be general intelligence which i'll describe in a moment and your manifest variable or observed variables that you actually do measure could be for example a score on a, on a vocabulary or a math test or, or, or uh, a cognitive test and when you're specifying these models right there are two main um model specifications that, it, that you need although they're not the only ones so for example you have Measure model, so you so that's just basically how do your latent variables and observed variables how do they relate with each other, right? So how many observed variables are you loading onto one latent on, onto a single latent factor or multiple latent factors, et cetera, et cetera? And also then you have the structural model. So how what are the associations between different latent variables? So for example, if you have um, like in intelligence research, you have crystallized intelligence, fluid intelligence, right? So you want to sort of model how those might be related to each other, um, which I'll show in, in subsequent slides. But you also you can specify variances, et cetera, et cetera, um, and perform multiple regressions as well. So as an example of just, just in cognition, so just for like the positive manifold, right? One of the famous models in intelligence research is, which you can model as, as a, as a uh, in SEM, is Spearman's G-factor model, right? So you have, again, on the left, you have this positive manifold, so all of these positive associations between cognitive tasks, right? But at the same time, you also can posit, right, that you have this latent factor, which will be all latent factors are denoted with circles, sort of G for general intelligence. And then you have your observed variables, um, which are which here are denoted in squares, right, for your various cognitive tasks. And you're positing basically that G is the is the mechanism, sort of sort of the the causal, in, in theory, is the causal entity for the 
common variance to share between these cognitive scores, right? So the reason, so you have these diff different loadings on these, on these abilities, and basically any change in G would have hypothesized to give you a certain change in um, scores, for example, you know, math tests or not, or another nonverbal test, right? So these, so for example, in, in, in this model, uh, this made up data is that G uh, loads very, very highly on math. So if you change G, it would have a very, very strong effect on maths, but not as much necessarily compared with say nonverbal, nonverbal um, cognition, right? But this is sort of like a basic model in, in SEM that you can sort of, um, do very easily in, in software. Now to sort of like the bread and butter of what we do in, in a lab that I work in, right, is sort of, we don't wanna just look at behavior in isolation. We also wanna look at how does the brain relate to, to behavior, right? And to do this, you use a special class of, 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 of some models, which are called mimic models. So there, it stands for multiple indicators, multiple causes models. Um, I did not make up the name, but you know it it, it works. Um, so here you have the same. So for example, you have this this really uh, brilliant researcher. Um, so maybe some of you heard of him. His name's Roger Kivit. Um, and so from from one of his papers, he said that you have so for example, you have the same G model that I had, right? So you have here your observed psych psychological variables, and here's the latent factor, factor G. But when you incorporate the brain, you could also say, okay, you can regress your neural variables whether they are you know, so say you say these are like white matter tracks, right? So you have sort of measures of white matter integrity, or this can be even probably like functional measures as well. Um, and they are hypothesized to give rise to G, right? So you're saying that the brain, you know, the brain underlies, you know, your, your latent factor G, which then underlies your performance on certain cognitive tasks. And you can put all of these in, in one model uh, through regression and, 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 and sort of estimate the fit of these models. So you have various goodness of fit statistics. Um, such as how well it fits to the to the observed data structure, right? And so, sort of looking at these in actual data, right? So, in one of in my first PhD project, we we looked at sort of um, in the com sample, which is a uh, which I'm sure many of you know, but it's it's a, a really rich uh, data set here here um, at the CBU, and we also looked at NK Rockland in NKI Rockland in uh, in the states. And basically, you're looking at these these mem models. So we have these ten white matter tracks for each for each um, sample, and we're seeing how does crystallized intelligence or GC and, and, and fluid intelligence GF how do they relate to each other, right? And you could you could so you you estimate sort of covariance between them, and you also sort of estimate how they would load onto various cognitive tasks or even other latent variables, right? And you could play around with the structure. So for here, for example, in this sample, the best fitting model was where crystallized intelligence and here WM is working memory, that these seem to be um, better when they were modeled as a single latent factor as opposed to uh, separated uh, here, right? So you can, so with some, you could test these very theory-based um, hypothesized models like and actually fit it to the actual data and then compare the model fit um, using what's called the AIC, which compares um, the complex, the, basically does the complexity of the model, the increased complexity, um, is it warranted given how well it improves sort of the fit of the model? Uh, okay. And so eventually, after reading uh, Roger's papers, I eventually, you know, met this guy um, and we actually have uh, written a, 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 written a chapter together sort of looking at sort of, so you can, so you can model, you can use SEM very, you know, on, on cross-sectional data, but, what about you know on longitudinal data, right? So multiple measures of of when you have you know for example multiple brain scans and also cogn cognitive uh, data that you've also collected in participants, right? Um, and basically, this this field, at least in intelligence research, is seems to be very it's, it's in its infancy, right? You have one pioneering study earlier in, in the mid '80s, but most of these studies come within like the last five years or so, um, where they where you have both brain and cognitive data. On multiple at multiple time points, right? And you know, but it's very important because, for example, you, we cannot. So, for example, if you have the G factor, there's a paper that, that came out. I think I think this year or late last year that said basically your between person G or general intelligence is not necessarily the same as your within person um, general intelligence, right? So you cannot predict them. You cannot predict within person changes from between 
person, individual differences, right? So you want to model these dynamics, especially in development. And this is important because we know, for example, just you know, by, by numerous studies that you know, timing matters, right? So you both your cognitive abilities and your and those brain correlates that are associated with them, they change rapidly over time. So for example, you have rapid changes to cortical thickness. Uh, so you have increased thickness and then subsequent thinning, right? Um, you also have, you, you know, we also know that depending on what methods you use, right? They have different advantages and different assumptions, right? But STEM is very nice because for example, in a very uh, simple model that we have in our, in our, in our chapter, is that you can have, for example, you know, an intelligence score at two time points and a brain uh, measure at two time points. And you could basically sort of correlate and see how predictive is sort of your brain structure, for example, at time point one, how well does it predict not only your intelligence at time point two, which is not drawn here, but particularly how does it relate to your change, right? So you could look at within person changes in intelligence based on previous brain structure. And you can do the same thing for changes in brain structure based on your intelligence at time point one, right? So you can look at these and try to see whether people differ not only at baseline, but also if they differ significantly in slope over time, um, which, is, which is very, very cool. Um, and of course, the more waves of data you have, the more interesting models you can fit, I would say. And of course, here's, here's, here's this uh, Kiva guy again. Um, is that you have th that these models can get very, very, very complex, right? So you can even do these special class called latent change score models, where you have again these latent these latent factors, so these latent neural factors, and latent cognitive factors. But you can also measure sort of the residual uh, uh, variance as well. So the variance is not explained. You can model sort of differences in that and, and estimate that as well. So you can you really it's a very rich um, source of um, and developing field where there's a lot of tools that are available to sort of fit these really complex models that you sort of that you can then compare and 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 subsequently maybe test more thoroughly in uh, experimental data and experimental setups. And so, as I say, in summary, um, SEM basically is is ve is very flexible and it, and is very comprehensible comprehensive. So you can do you can measure and compare do a lot of different multivariate approaches to study these be either between person differences for cross-sectional data or even within person changes um, in brain behavior relationships. Um, like I said, it's theory-based. So when you fit models, the way you specify latent variables and how to relate to observed variables should be based on theory, right? You should, you should basically have a reason as to why you think that these variables relate in the way that they do based on previous literature or if you're trying to sort of push the, push the envelope. Right, which allows for model comparison through, like I said, the comple different complexity measures and goodness of fit, which then feeds back into the process to enable better, e even further theory building um, later on. So these models can get more and more sophisticated um, and robust over time. And as well, there, so SEM is not the only game in town, right? So you have other modeling approaches such as such as network networks network science, so they which which do not replace. They, neither of them replace each other, but they complement each other, right? So each one, you could look at different, um, you know, different facets of the same phenomena through multiple approaches. But SEM is is one that um, has a lot of a very rich history and, and a lot of online resources um, for various issues that you have, like especially on R. Uh, in, in R, you use very big online community that gives you um, that gives you help with things like model convergence, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, which will happen when you have <laughs> longitudinal data, um, your model just doesn't just doesn't produce any output for whatever reason, right? So you have to kind of play around with the variances and different measures to to make it to help to allow it to converge. So with that, as I am not a psychometrician at at by any stretch of the imagination, um, I want to finish by just giving this these list of, of some resources and and references. Uh, particularly, you know, this historical overview, um, you kind of have the Bible of structural equation modeling, if you per se, um, and, uh, but you also can look at another sort of recent work on longitudinal data. So for people who are studying development or things with multiple, uh, multiple time series, the R package Levon is particularly, um, I would say the most prevalent, the one that I use and that uh, is probably the most prevalent, at least in R to use, it's also M plus, et cetera, et cetera. And you also have, you know, the journals, for example, structural equation modeling and psychometrica, uh, which which give you a lot more quantitative, much more mathematical models for structural equation modeling. So it, it can get very, very 
uh, intense mathematically. And with that, I would like to thank you for, for listening and I, that's the end of my talk.